Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of Gemology for Schmucks. Once again, my name is Peter Nelson, and I'm here to guide you in everything you need to know about gemstones. I had a good friend send to me this parcel of rings. There are 20 rings in here, and most of them are vintage that were bought in estate sales, things like that. So we've got some Art Deco, we've got some Victorian, we've got things that were made over the past 200 years that were bought somewhat recently. And one thing that is very common about this type of ring is that they didn't have access to gemstones back in the day, but they were using something they called paste. Paste is just glass. I don't know why they thought paste sounded nice, because to me that's what kindergartners eat. But anyhow, the wisdom of the ages is lost to the ages and I'll move on. So my task with this project was to take these old vintage rings, some with their busted up old pastes and imitation gems, and then to repurpose them with natural gemstones. Well, I should correct myself. Some of them are treated, but just as beautiful. They grew in the earth, but they had an additional treatment applied to them that made them much more attractive than they were when they first came out of the earth. An example of that is blue topaz. Over 99% of blue topaz is treated. Is it beautiful? Yes, it is. Is it cheap? Absolutely. And that's one thing that makes it come to a nice price point for the average person who just wants daily wear jewelry. It is a stone that comes from the earth, and it's gorgeous. And it's cheap. What's to complain about? So today my goal is to tell you about how you go about taking vintage rings or any kind of ring that has a stone or maybe lost its stone and to put a new stone in it. The first thing that you're gonna need to do is have a precision measuring tool. So I've got here calipers or you can also use a gauge. These gauges are very common in the gem trade. If you go to a booth, a dealer is 99% of the time going to have one of these, not one of these. I was walking around measuring settings and stones with these and people were kind of like, I'm now famous for it. Don't mind me, personally I like being famous for random accoutrement, but that's, uh, that's me. I'm a terrible hipster. Both of these tools, regardless of which one you like most, are very precision measuring tools. So they give you a fraction of a millimeter, if you think about it in the American way with fractions, or you can give a 1.4, 1.45 kind of measurement in millimeters using either of these tools. I prefer the calipers because this other side allows me to get to the inside of a setting, which is very helpful when you're measuring something like a bezel. A bezel is a cup-like setting. So this right here, this ring with the piece of tanzanite in it, has a metal rim that goes around the entirety of the outside. This is called a bezel setting. The place where the stone sits is called the seat. And what we need to do is get a very accurate measurement of the seat and then go around and find a stone that will fit inside of this setting. Once we do that, we can just take it over to one of the goldsmiths and get them to set the ring by closing in the metal around the top of the stone. But it's very important that we measure correctly. Otherwise, you're gonna have a stone that jiggles around in the setting and it's not going to be right. Not to mention it's gonna scare the tar out of anybody who buys your ring because nobody likes to hear in their rings. It's an omen of bad things to come. There are many things to like about the bezel setting, like this piece of tanzanite here, gorgeous color. You can get nice, big, clean stones with great color. And oftentimes it's more affordable than something like sapphire or ruby. And the lively color of this tanzanite fits really well in this bezel setting that can make some stones feel a little bit dark. But in this case, because we've got such a light colored tanzanite, it actually amplifies the color a bit. Even in something like this Victorian ring, which I've been calling the compass because it's got the north, south, east, and west. I don't know what it's technically called, but I like it. What I had to start by doing was measuring across the seat, not just where the prongs are, but the seat of the actual gemstone. So again, that seat is where the gemstone is going to be sitting in and the prongs are gonna get closed in on top of it to hold it into place. So I have to get an idea of what is the length, what is the width, and what is the depth of that setting. What kind of stone can I put in this seat? Now I mentioned depth and that's very important because length and width, you can find a stone that will fit into that seat, but if you're not careful with the depth, you're gonna end up with a ring that is far too deep. And what that means is when you go to put your ring on, if the culet is sticking out through the bottom of the setting, then it's gonna gash your finger up and that is a scary thought. Or if it's another type of setting where it's got what's called a gallery, that's a closed in area at the bottom of the ring before it contacts with the shank of the ring, that's the, the ring part of the ring. If it has that gallery, then the stone just won't be able to sit all the way into the seat. The culet, that bottom part, will be stopping it from going all the way into the seat. So measuring the depth is very important. Now true, we can get any stone recut, but the problem is because of the natural properties of gemstones, in order to have a stone that looks like it's alive, then you have to have a certain angle on the pavilion. And that angle is going to be connected to what's called the depth percentage. How deep is the stone compared to how wide it is? 
Now, different stones have different properties and that's connected to the refractive index that we talked about in a different video. But it's very important that you preserve that depth percentage because if you don't have the right percentage, then your stone is not going to be deep enough and you're going to have a vicious window. So a perfect example of that is this cocktail ring. It's got a nice big stone and originally it was an imitation emerald. Now an imitation emerald is just probably a piece of glass. So they can cut it to whatever shape they want and it's gonna look nice, it's gonna have a nice body color, but they don't have the same constraints of getting that depth. So the depth percentage is not important for that stone. They can make whatever stone they want. So when I'm replacing this with a nice sky blue topaz, what I have to do is buy a topaz and get it recut so that it fits for this setting because this one has a gallery in the bottom. This gallery will not allow the culet of the stone to go all the way into the setting, so I have to recut the stone in order for it to fit in. And what happens because of that is this sizable window in the middle. Now fortunately, it's not so bad, so you still get a lot of play of color on the outsides of the stone, but as you get into those deeper areas of the stone where the stone should be continuing if we had ideal proportions, then unfortunately we have window because we did not preserve those ideal proportions. This is for reappropriating vintage or antique jewelry. So finding a stone that fits exactly in your ring that's already pre-cut in the market is the best way to go. Obviously, you don't need to spend any extra money on recutting, but sometimes that stone just doesn't exist, like in the case of the cocktail ring. So if you're interested in replacing the stones in some of these vintage jewelry pieces, then you need to keep in mind that if you're using a natural stone, ideal proportions are a real thing. So looking into the appropriate depth percentage for the stone that you're interested in can help you know whether it's possible or not possible with the ring that you have. If you're buying these for resale online, then that can help you to get an idea of, should I really be buying this ring or is it a lost cause? The thing that this project has really driven home for me is that design is dictated by the nature of the stone. If we have a stone that we're interested in, it's better to find the stone and design a piece of jewelry around it. We can change the dimensions to whatever we want in order to fit the stone. The price of gold compared to the price of a gemstone is substantially different in many gemstones. So it's much better to find a stone that you already love and then design the ring around that. In a future video, and many videos I expect, we're going to be talking about how that can be done. Because if you try and make a stone fit into a jewelry setting that is not designed for it, sometimes that comes back with some unpleasant results. And that's all we've got for today. Thank you very much for joining me on Gemology for Schmucks. If you've got any questions, please leave them in the comments section below. Hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, and tell all of your friends about it so they can learn too. And until next time, I'll say bye-bye. <laughs>